Okay, so it's uh, 6 p.m. Pacific Sharp. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this is the sixth um, episode of the Industry Spotlight, uh, which is the podcast organized by Corporate Liaison Program of Santa Clara Valley Section. Uh, we have organized largely technical talks, but uh, Today we have a double header. We'll have a both technical talk, and then thereafter we'll host the corporate partnership program uh, for my Tripoli um, talk. Um, uh, just a couple of um, logistical uh, details. Uh, this talk is recorded. Uh, everyone is muted uh, upon entrance so that we can have a more pleasurable experience for recording. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. You can start asking them, and you can do that using Q and A um, a box uh, at the bottom and to to your right, or by clicking on few dots. You can also chat if you prefer. Um, and uh, the first technical talk uh, will be given by Chetan Gupta. I have my colleague, the member of the uh, corporate uh, liaison program uh, committee. Shmuel Sharan, who worked together with Chetan for many years. I did too, but it was in the in the longer past. So with this, uh, Shmuel, would you like to introduce our speaker? Good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce my, I would say, ex-colleague, but the ex is me at the Global Hitachi Corporation. Chetan Gupta is the vice president, chief data scientist and architect, and is currently the head of the industrial AI lab at Hitachi America Limited. He has more than 15 years of experience in analytics, AI, big data and related domains. And over his career, he has worked both as a machine learning data scientist, as well as in designing systems and architecture for big data application. At his current job at Hitachi, he manages a large team of data scientists architects and developers that are all engaged in developing cutting gauge solution and opening new frontiers and in industrial analytics. I will cut it short. Chetan has close to 50 patents, either granted or under review, and more than 50 publications in the area of data mining, machine learning, data stream, etc. Chetan has a PhD in mathematics and an MS in mathematical computer science and chemical engineering from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Thank you, Chetan, for making the presentation. Much appreciated. Thank you for the introduction. I was saying earlier on mute, that is, that I should have cut my bio short, sounded too much. But, um, but it's been a great honor working with you, Schmidt, in the past and Dehan as well. Uh, to have colleagues as yourself. Um, so I think part of the introduction sort of tees up with my talk. So uh, in the last part, Shmuel said that two things that I think stand out for me. One was the fact that I am a chemical engineer first, and then I did my PhD in mathematics and computer science. So very much, um, I think of the world from an engineering lens, and you will see that throughout the talk. And in my current job, what we're trying to do is innovate in the area of industrial AI. And today's talk is focused on that. So what I want to do is uh, give a high-level overview of what it means to do industrial AI, what are kind of the problems that we are solving, and take to some tales from the field uh, and disperse with some sort of research questions that I think are important and should be answered. Um, to sort of give you an idea about uh, what is being done in the field today, what's being deployed, and where the field might evolve to in the future. Um, I want to keep it informal. Um, so. Dehan, if you want to interrupt me at the end of a section uh, for some questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Um, so let me start then. So, um, so this is the agenda we'll follow. Uh, we'll talk about uh, introduction to industrial AI. Uh, I'll try to explain to you the problem space. And, uh, and so you might think at the first brush that industrial AI is sort of uh, not one topic, but one of the efforts that we have done at Hitachi from a systematic research perspective is to bring some order to the space so that we can talk about industrial AI uh, from a vertical agnostic perspective. And I'll talk about that in the second chapter. 
we talk about a bunch of use cases uh, in, in section three, and this is where I'll try to sort of speed up because there are very many use cases and we might not have time to go through all of them. Uh, section number four is actually very important. It talks about some of the challenges that we have experienced, things that we have learned as we try to operationalize these AI solutions in the field. Remember that uh, uh, operationalizing an AI solution in the industrial field is very different from operationalizing an AI solution uh, in sort of a different domain. And I'll talk about some of those challenges here, and then I'll talk about the future in some countries. So, so what is industrial AI, right? So at a broad level, it is the definition is sort of straightforward. Uh, it is the application of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and related technologies in addressing real world challenges in the societal context. And uh, and I have been sort of uh, in the space at least at Hitachi for the last seven eight years now. And over this time, I've worked in a large number of verticals from say oil and gas, mining, power transfer distribution, building energy management systems, railway systems, automotive, fleets, and so on and so forth. And what we have tried to do is instead of taking a vertical perspective on saying, look, I'm going to do AI for mining or AI for oil and gas. Um, we took a step back and said, are there functional areas from a purely uh, industrial perspective that we can address systematically? So this this would not surprise you for folks who have uh, actually uh, do actual things. That's one of the big big areas: maintenance, repair. You need to keep your assets up and running. You want to optimize your assets. That's operations optimization. If you're manufacturing uh, or even in mining, very many operations you want to have some quality of assurance when you produce something using your operations. You want to do it safely. And then at the uh, at sort of the surrounding all these activities is your supply chain, and then uh, automation control in terms of uh, AI machine learning, and I'll talk about that as well. So where you want to go finally is end-to-end -end optimization, and this is somewhat of a holy grail right now. I mean, this is where ultimately we want to uh, get to, uh, um, but this is where we're slowly progressing. Okay, so. One another way to look at industrial AI is who it benefits from. Uh, <clears throat> so certainly we strongly believe that industrial AI has the potential to transform the world around us, uh, making it greener, sustainable, and better in so many ways. Uh, if you're talking to folks who would be using industrial AI, um, you would find them in two categories. So one would be users operators, right? Supposing you're running a large chemical plant, or you're running a large fleet, you're running a sh uh, sort of fleet of ships or whatever. The other would be OEMs who manufacture <clears throat> these equipment. So this is sort of a crude uh, partition, but it's still sort of helpful in thinking about how your solutions can benefit uh, those who want to use them. So in terms of operators, the kind of benefits you would see is you want to increase your operational efficiency, extend the life of your equipment, increase uptime and reliability so that it doesn't fail in the field. You want to lower your operations and maintenance costs, increase safety, quality, and so on and so forth, right? From an OEM perspective, I think it's even more interesting. So one of the things we have realized lately is that uh, use of AI machine learning uh, can lead to design improvement. And in fact, it will lead to a change in the way things get done. So um, to give you an example in mining industry, so right now if you go to a large open pit mine, you'll see this very, very giant trucks. Um, and as automation comes in, you will see them being replaced by smaller trucks because um, if you can manage the trucks in an automated way, then these smaller trucks make more economical sense than these large trucks, right? So the whole design of mine will change because of our ability to automate um, the operations in our mine. So this is sort of a radical transformative changes you will see in industrial operations as AI and machine learning becomes more mainstream. Uh, you also want to be able to, at a product level, make innovation. Uh, in terms of uh, making products more reliable, uh, greener products that don't fail, that are more energy efficient, and so on and so forth using AI machine learning. The third big sort of <clears throat> area that we see from an OEM perspective is enabling new services. So if you talk to some top tier uh, manufacturers, they're always fa facing competition from uh, sort of a lower end, cheaper uh, 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 competition, right? So they want to do is introduce two things. One is as a service model, right? So instead of selling you an equipment, I'll sell you a service itself, um, which will come with its own sort of SLAs and guarantees. So all the operations and maintenance costs is absorbed by the OEM themselves. So this is sort of a new way of doing business from a from a uh, OEM perspective. 
And um, that's a th okay, well, I think that's, that's fine, I think. And the next one is genuine parts and sales. This is sort of a common use case, which occurs in other industries as well, is can I cross sell, upsell? And, and also from a, from a purely industrial perspective, if you know equipment is going to need certain things, is going to fail, then you can sort of uh, um, tell your consumers that, look, I need to replace this part at this time and provide incentives and so on and so forth. Another uh, big uh, is the warranty construction. So anyway, so, so instead of spending too much time elaborating each of these cases, this is a broad category of benefits that you can have if you do industrial AI properly. Um, in terms of data, um, I want to sort of paint a sort of a broader picture, and I think many of you are very familiar with this. So like 80s and early 90s, you saw enterprise data. That was a big deal. We were putting data in a data warehouse, then using BI over that. The next wave was the social media data, uh, where we were sort of collecting human generated in terms of images, in terms of blog posts, or tweets, or whatever, and learning something over them and using for some sort of a business benefit. Where we are is from an industrial AI perspective is machine generated data. And this is from sensors or videos and want to capture this data and try to do something to benefit uh, uh, our operations. Okay? And the interesting part is from an industrial AI perspective, it's not sufficient to include look at machine generated data. You also, for very, very many applications, uh, there is a problem data heterogeneity, right? So if you're doing AI machine learning, you need to incorporate enterprise data, human generated data, as well as machine generated data. So where we are is sort of uh, usage of all three uh, kinds of data. In terms of what type of data you would see, uh, you would see a lot of sensor data. That should be obvious, right? Time, series data, the temperature, pressure, vibration data. The other data that you see very often is what we call event data. And I think many of you know that is from autonomic computing perspective, but as well as if you look at fleets, right? So many of you, if you take your car, for example, for oil change, you will see someone um, inserting a dongle, an OB, it's called an OB2 dongle into the car and downloading some fault codes. So what does those fault codes enumerate a list of problems um, that could be with your equipment? And, um, and the technician then uses those power codes to sort of diagnose what uh, repair needs to be done, for example. And then you have maintenance records, uh, the transaction records, like this was you know, when the equipment came in, um, this was the repair that was done, this was the cost, blah, 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 the operational data as to what equipment was doing at what time, for how long. And there's uh, surprisingly, uh, not surprisingly, I should say, increasingly we are seeing more natural language data. So for example, uh, uh, very many, um, uh, Corporations now produce uh, uh, apps for people to use with their uh, equipment. And so these apps record uh, their voice memos or might require a complaint. For example, my uh, coolant is leaking or the motor is not working, whatever it is, right? So can you use that data itself to do something with it? We're collecting a lot of visual data now from an inspection perspective. There's a lot of use cases like that in the industry. And then uh, we're looking at acoustic data as well. So these are some broad category of data that you will see as you do AI machine learning uh, in the industry domain. <clears throat> so what are some of the key challenges if you want to sort of uh, <clears throat> use AI machine learning? And hopefully as we go through the presentation, you will find clues to how to address these challenges. So one of the bigger challenges around data collection processes, right? So, uh, so when these systems were designed, so many of them are sort of legacy systems. Uh, and the the systems are not the data collection in these systems is not designed for the purpose of AI machine learning. They are very often designed for regulatory purposes, right? To meet some regulatory requirements. And the question that becomes for us as machine learning data science people is, can I then use this data to uh, to learn something that is beneficial uh, to uh, the corporation? Right? And this data is often complete, and missing uh, sort of often incomplete, uh, missing and noisy data. And data is often collecting different operation modes, right? And that operation mode might not be there. For example, think of an equipment, it might be in a standby mode, it might be sort of running in top gear, and you might not collect the operation data, the operation mode itself, but the data around it. And then when you're trying to learn from it, it turns out it becomes difficult. And then there are no uh, sort of uh, benchmark data. Right? So this is, so if you think about the progress that AI machine learning has made in the last several years, a lot of it is because we created this large benchmark data sets, then we created some uh, deep networks over that, and then there became a starting point to do sort of uh, fine green things. Unfortunately, in the industrial domain, we don't have such benchmark data sets to start from, and that sort of limits the accuracy in many cases of what we could do. 
From a modeling perspective, as I said, one of the big challenges is heterogeneity of data. Um, and, and models that work with small data with few positive examples, right? So suppose you're looking at data prediction for some equipment in your operation. Now, what will happen most often is that you will not have collected a large amount of data from that equipment itself, right? Compared to, say, the number of images uh, that are out there or the text data and so on. Right? So, so we need to sort of um, modify our, our current way of doing things to work with small data. The other, op other thing that I think you would appreciate is the need for explanations, right? So if I make a model and my model makes a prediction, very often industrial domain that prediction or that recommendation goes through a human operator. And because you need that, that sanity check. And then human operator, it has to sort of make sense to them as to why that model is saying what it is saying, right? So you need, when you make a model, you need it to be explainable. You need to explain to the person who's using the model that look, this is how the model works. And, and that person is not mathematical, right? You can't show them AI code, you can't show them the algorithm, right? You have to convince them somehow that based on other parameters or, or, or the features that the model is using, that this model does make sense. Uh, the fourth challenge that is very fascinating to me, and I think it's largely a very unsolved problem, is the system of systems in a complex environment, right? So right now we're doing individual AI. So think about, um, uh, so think about a city, right? So you might be sort of doing some AI machine learning over your street lights. You might be doing it over your sewage system. Individually, that's just as a big deal. But you might be doing it individual equipments in each of these systems, subsystems. But if you want to optimize for the overall city, can you model this system of system in, a, in this very complex dynamic environment if you think about a city, right? So this, no, this challenge of modeling complex systems is very much sort of an open problem and a very fascinating problem in my mind. And the, the last thing is incorporating domain knowledge. It's back to the guy who is going to use your model. You know, he has been working in the field for 30, 40 years. This person knows a lot. Uh, is there a way for us to capture that knowledge and use it to make a machine learning smarter? And that also is a very hard problem. Purely from an operationalized perspective, uh, I'll talk about it later, but cost trade-offs are very important, right? So as you're making your, uh, let me give you an example, for example. Suppose um, you know, a few years ago, I used to drive a very dinky old cheap car. Uh, it's sort of straight off my grad school days. I used to drag it even now. And if I felt that my car had a failure chance of uh, uh, even 50%, I would risk it because the cost of failure to me wasn't very high. But think of an airliner, a jet uh, carrying passengers. And, and if you think that the probability of failure is even 0.5%, you have to ground the flight, right? Simply because the cost of failure in that case is very, very, very high. So, and very often in industrial operations, you will realize that these costs of failures are really actually very high. So you have to be, so as you make your recommendation, your determination as to what to do, you need to be able to balance these costs. And decision-making under certainty is another thing, right? So meaning that you don't know how accurate your model is in a current regime, and can you use the model then to make a decision? We talked about humans in the loop, and my favorite is real world is analog. It's not digital, right? So you're more trying to model the real world. Uh, industrial world is sort of the physical world, and it is not digital, it's analog. So there is this interface between digital and analog where you lose something every time. And the question is, are you losing too much? Or have you retained enough to be able to solve a meaningful problem? So this sort of concludes section one. Um, I'll next talk about the problem space. Um, Dian, should we? Uh, are there any questions that I need to take, or they can take? No, I suggest that we. Uh, I mean, there's one question uh, from Deepak Matur. Can AI help in predicting increasing ultimate recovery factor of oil and gas from oil reservoir? How? I think we did something like that. So what happens if I remember correctly? Uh, it depends on what kind of oil well it is. If you think from a such uh, shale deposits perspective. I think there are instrumentation that you can do. Um, so what you could do is learn a model uh, over historical data, uh, meaning that, uh, so if you're recording the oil production from say, say Bakun, for example, over several wells, then if that well is, uh, if a new well is dug nearby, then based on the parameters of other wells, um, you could uh, estimate uh, what the production uh, curve would look like for that particular well. So I think there is uh, work in that space. 
And if you if you send an email to me, I should be able to find some references for you. Um, and Chetan, I recommend we leave all the questions for the end so that you can more uh, uh, um, move more uh, smoothly. And then we'll ask questions okay, at the very right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. So now let me give you some uh, problem space. Right? So as I said, uh, we take a systematic decision to not think about industrial AI vertically, but rather horizontally, right? So and let me ex motivate that by giving you some examples, right? So think about mining. So I don't know how many of you know mining. Actually, mining is very fascinating. It's sort of uh, a very complex operation. So uh, this is an open pit mine. So open pit mine is, is sort of very often what you see is a very large pit, and the large pit there's a blast surface, and then these are these very giant shovels that you shovel that you see, for example, the white thing over here. SM2, these are very giant shovels, and they pick up uh, either ore or waste, depending on your blast uh, profile, and then these trucks line up, right? So these trucks line up, and the shovel dumps. If it is ore, it will dump uh, into a truck that goes to a processing plant. If it is waste, it will dump into a truck and it goes to a waste place, and that sort of cycle goes on and on and on, right? So if you think about what kind of problems you want to solve. First is from a purely mining perspective, right? The profile of what you want to um, to mine depends on your uh, demand prediction, right? So you want to say, okay, I suppose you're doing coal. I will need I will need high grade coal of this person, a mix with a medium grade coal of this person, mix and so on, so forth, right? So you look at demand prediction. That's how you plan your mine operations. So I will going to mine in this particular area, which is high grade coal, blah blah. blah. That's the first. Now you say, okay. Fine, I'm running my mind. I need to truck schedule and dispatch, right? That's the main problem. Because if you don't do it correctly, two things will happen. The one is the trucks will begin to queue up, like in this picture. And every time a truck is queued up, it's not being productive, right? What you really ideally want is a truck to sort of be carrying something from one place to the other. That's when it's being productive. So this is called queuing. The other problem that occurs if you don't schedule properly is that the shovel is starving meaning it is ready to dump something into a truck, but there's no truck nearby because trucks are busy somewhere else, and now the shovel is being used. Right, so this is the problem of scheduling dispatch. The next problem is that now that you've done a beautiful job of scheduling dispatch, you still want to make sure that equipment doesn't fail in the field. Because failure in the field in the mine is very, very expensive. Right, so you want to do predator maintenance. And then once you have everything working well, you want to do pit-to-port optimization, meaning there might be a rail car, a, 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 rail system that takes your output to a ship and what you really want to do is time everything so this is sort of the set of problems you want to really solve if you want to optimize mine operation so let's look at manufacturing right again manufacturing start with demand forecasting right you want to know how much of a product that i want to make right? and then based on that you would again say okay i have this product uh, this is the backlog and suddenly there's a new sort of urgent uh, requirement comes in so now you have dynamic dispatching again, right? So which job should go where, which uh, which station uh, should do what, right? So this just becomes a problem of dispatch. Very similar to what you saw in mining, that this time you're dispatching jobs or workers or equipment, in the other case, you're dispatching trucks. Um, similar to, we didn't talk about this in mining, but you can do this operator profiling, right? So there are operators with different skill sets, with different efficiency, and you won't really want to know which operator is, is most suitable for a particular job, very much for the drivers as well in the truck. And you do quality prediction, right? So as you could see, the the problem of uh, in a very diverse industry like mining and manufacturing are somewhat similar. So based on this insight, uh, we have developed this taxonomy of problems. And here I talk about maintenance repair, operations optimization, quality, uh, supply chain, we didn't have space for that, safety, blah, blah, blah. And I categorize them to three categories of descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive, right? And our belief is that if you can solve these problems, to a large extent, you will be able to solve your customer problem. And this taxonomy is derived from our experience. We didn't cook it up sitting in ivory tower. I've talked to, I think, hundreds of people at this time, by this time. And, um, and this is based on that knowledge, right? Based on that interaction. I've learned so much in the field. And so we believe that if you solve these problems, so whether you're working in the power and gas industry, the, the specific solution might be different, but the problem sort of description remains somewhat similar. So that could be TND, it could be mining, it could be manufacturing, blah, blah. So this is, I think, where a lot of value in industrial AI is. So industrial AI is, is sort of a systematic field, is what I want to tell you, with a set of its own problems, its own challenges, its own data set, um, that if you are able to solve, you can really have a very significant impact on the world that we live. 
Um, another view of industrial AI is from a mathematical perspective, right? So given that the data that you have um, and, um, and, the, and the business problems we've talked about in the previous slide, what is the sort of a categorization from a math perspective, right? So very often it is estimation, right? You want to estimate some measurement or indicator. You want to do some diagnosis to see whether this is true or not. You might want to do prognostics, really predict what's going to happen in the future. You might want to recommend an action and then evaluate whether the action taken was right. Or right? So, so mathematically, this allows you to now map your favorite machine learning AI algorithm to a particular problem because most of the problems in the previous section fall into one of these categories. So this is the mapping that we do. This is the mapping that we do between a business problem and the math problem. I want to sort of conclude this section by mentioning uh, another thing because this often comes up when you talk about AI machine learning in the industry space is about automation, right? So what is the sweet spot of AI machine learning today? So if you think about the three sort of from a time perspective, the three sort of decision cycles. One is control, right? This is immediate. So I see something, I need to respond in subsequent. And today this is, you guys know this much better than I do, and many of you, we do a lot of control theory for that. A machine learning is trying to slowly make a foray into this, but I don't think we are there yet. Primarily because uh, our, um, I, I would say algorithms are not that confident, not that accurate that we can do real world control. And you can see the challenges even with autonomous driving, where I think we're close, we're doing very well there, but it has been a huge investment by so many corporations, by so many scientists, and for one problem of autonomous driving, right? Imagine the number of problems that industrial space has. So we don't have the capacity or the bandwidth to sort of attack each of these problems with such large force. So that's where one of the, so the control is still sort of an open area. The sweet spot of AI machine learning is actually operation. If you, if you think about what we talked about in mining and manufacturing, a lot of the problems that we start solving are operations problems, which have sort of minutes to days time scale, so you can, and the, the advantage, the reason you have that is because even right, even now, the output is mediated through a human being. We're not confident enough to have a completely autonomous system for where the uh, cost of making mistake is high. I'll give, give you an example of, of some automation robotics, but we're slowly getting there, right? But the sweet spot today is around operation. And then, uh, and then the, the last one is strategy, which is very difficult for AI machine learning because you still don't understand the KPIs. If you talk to any corporation executive, they will not be able to describe how they take the decision. They will not be able to tell you what data precisely they sort of used to make that decision, right? So that's why the strategy is difficult. Control is we are being conservative. We want to be very careful about how we do control and under what circumstances we do control. So the sweet spot is operation. So I'll stop at this with this section. So that hopefully give you an idea about um, the kind of business problem, math problems um, that we want to solve with uh, uh, AI machine learning. Okay, so uh, let's go to some use cases. and. Uh, I'll sort of be quick through them, and in the end, if there's some particular interest, um, we can go back and sort of talk about it. So let's talk about maintenance use cases first. I'll talk about maintenance operations and, and safety and so on and so forth. So from maintenance perspective, typically the cycle is this, right? So you monitor something, then you predict. Uh, typically prediction prognostics is a very hot area. So we're gonna talk some more about it. Then you, if you say something's going to fail, uh, whether through machine learning or something is failing um, because you're observing it through diagnostics or prognostics, you want to make a recommendation uh, of what to do, and finally you want to evaluate. So let me talk about some diagnosis. Right, this is an example that we are, I think you will see in other places as well. But this is the work that we're doing in our lab is to look at images of vehicles and see if we can do surface defect detection uh, using image data. And this is from a uh, from a purely uh, machine learning perspective, this is not that straightforward because the damages, defects can occur in various types. Uh, the vehicles can come in sort of various shapes and forms, and we're trying to extend this in general to all kinds of equipment to the surface type, surface properties will change as well, right? So this is, but you will start seeing applications like this quite often. In fact, I think a lot of insurance companies are already deploying something to this effect, not to sort of identify the areas of damage, but much, much more to sort of estimate the cost of fixing them. Right? So, but this is one area where, uh, as an example of diagnostics using image data. The next is prognostics, right? So prognostics, you will typically see two problems. Um, they're very related to each other, they're cousins, I would say. 
The one is the problem of failure prediction. And it says that, look, what I want to do is, to, what I want you want to do is tell me if my equipment is going to fail in the next K days or not, right? And what is the probability of failure in the next K days, right? Um, so easier part is the binary prediction. You can always ask for the sort of probability of how many more. The more harder problem is a remaining useful life estimation. Where you want to say is how many days there are to a failure today, right? So the model should tell me right now, so this equipment is going to fail in 10 days. So you're no longer making binary prediction over the next K days, but you're trying to sort of figure out what the future looks like uh, for this particular piece of equipment. So RUN tends to be a harder problem. And they come in very many varieties. So here I sort of tried to organize the space of uh, a prognostics problem. And I will not go through the whole flow, uh, but the idea is that based on your requirements, meaning whether there is a human, uh, so sometimes if you work with an equipment, there might be a KPI that is available. Someone says, okay, if you look at this particular sensor or this combination of sensors, then this is a very good indicator of whether the failure is going to occur or not. And this is often learned through interaction with domain experts, but very often this is very difficult to optic. Right? So, so if the KPI is not available, then you are in the world of whether you have few examples or multiple examples of failure. Right? So very often for very many industrial equipment, um, the, exam the failures will not be that many. Right? Because we, we do design, we meaning, uh, in general we design equipment that doesn't fail very often. Right? So now you, need, you might have uh, data, but with few failures, right? How do you model that? And there are again multiple ways of doing that, whether you want to um, obtain a health indicator or not. And so forth. If you have very many failures, then again, uh, there are very many ways of doing it, right? So if you want a very explainable model, then you might want to build a health indicator, right? So that's this curve over this third box over there. If you're okay not making a very explainable model, then you need to again think about whether the failures are abrupt or they are sort of slow degradation. And then sort of becomes a different flow. And where a lot of work right now is ongoing, where you see very many papers being written and cited is, is on the sequential models and functional models. So you'll see a lot of use of LSTMs, RNNs for failure prediction. We have tried lately to use FNN, which are functional neural networks. I think the fascinating mathematics behind FNN. Uh, I would like, for people who want to model time series data, I would recommend uh, looking at FNNs um, and and see um, how they behave for your problems. In our experience, uh, for very many problems, the SNNs have been able to outperform uh, LS teams in RN. So I think it's a very promising area looking at sensor data. Um, so now, uh, so we talked about uh, diagnostics. We looked at, for example, with the images to see if something was going to fail or not. Some of this image is not coming up, right? Then you look at prognostics. Now, the third thing that, which is a very interesting problem is repair recommendation. Right now, so the equipment has failed or is going to fail, it's, and now you need to know what to do with it, right? So you might think that repairing something is a straightforward problem. Actually, repairing something is a very hard problem, especially with equipment that is very complex, very large, complicated equipment like this truck that you see, I, you don't get an idea about how big this is. It's almost as tall as a five-story building, for example, right? So you actually need to climb the stairs up there. This human being is actually very, very small. Um, the tires, uh, if I stand with my hands raised, then I would not even come to the top of the tire. These are very, very large fronts. And these are almost like plants on wheels, right? So if they fail, what is the right repair to be done? And um, and what you're seeing is sort of a paucity of trained technicians who can diagnose such complex equipment, right? So then the question becomes, can you use AI machine learning to figure out what's wrong with the equipment? Or more importantly, uh, a simpler question actually is, can you tell me how to fix the system? And that's where the repair commission comes. And finally, once you have sort of fixed your equipment, you want to see whether the uh, the fix is working or not. So this example is from uh, a chiller system. So chiller system, and I've taken an example of chemical cleaning. So you, you do chemical cleaning of a chiller system to sort of make it a bit, to, to improve its performance. So performance degrees over time because there's some chemical buildup, you need to clean up, and then sort of goes back. Right? The question that was posed to us is, and there's overhaul, you do complete overhaul as well. The question that you posed to us, that was posed to us was, sorry, was, is this maintenance effective or not? And then once you're able to categorize this, uh, you can do all sorts of questions. You can say whether a particular vendor is doing good maintenance or not, uh, whether a particular maintenance uh, method 
or process or is, is good or not. And the way you do it is it's actually somewhat straightforward, but what you want to do is you want to build, uh, you need to take some KPI that reflects the performance of the equipment. You want to compare the before and after, right? Like the ads that you see in TV, right? So they say, if you take a pill, you know, you lose weight or whatever. And so you do a before and after statistical comparison uh, and a systematic way. And then you can say that, does this sort of make a difference? For me? So this, I think, is a very fascinating problem to, to work on as well. Uh, and um, to sort of to more research you problems, so if you notice, till now I've talked about uh, uh, specific equipment failures, but very often this equipment is uh, is part of a large sort of network, right? So if you think of a chemical plant, for example, chemical plant is is a process, uh, a process plant. Different equipments are connected to each other. Things are happening, right? So so if we, so. So can I now extend what I've learned uh, in the previous section uh, to networks, not just to individual equipment? And this is also sort of a somewhat, I would say, industry problem. So to go from individual equipment to industrial networks. Um, there is some work using uh, graphical CNNs. Um, uh, and I think those are, uh, we published a paper on that that you can check out if you're interested in this problem. But that's, that's the next step in, some, in terms of uh, complexity of these problems. So we talked about maintenance, the next horizontal is operations. Let me quickly go through that as well. So this is sort of a flow in operations. As I said, you do production planning, then you do execution and do supervision. And the planning would involve demand forecasting, it might require process parameter estimation and scheduling. And finally, you wanted to see if uh, things are being done well or not, if operator is doing well or not. So this is sort of a problem around supply chain. And what you want to do is, Inventory management. So here, this is a combination of simulation uh, plus optimization. So what you want to do is uh, build a very robust simulator that can simulate different scenarios, and then in the real scenario towards the right, when you see when a, when in the real when you're actually using the system, you do a matching, and then you find the right ways to optimize it. So, but the overall point I wanted to say is that AI machine learning is now sort of trying to solve the inventory management problem from production. The, the next thing is uh, <clears throat> operations uh, dynamic dispatch. Right? So we talked about the, the truck problem and we talked about the manufacturing problem. And uh, uh, in this case, we are sort of uh, trying, to, and I, the next one is, I think, the mining example, sort of, sort of bundle them together in terms of time. But the idea was, can you use deep reinforcement learning to do an optimal dispatching for your jobs in the case of uh, uh, manufacturing or trucks in case of mining. And as many of you know, maybe all of you know, uh, reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning has been very successful uh, in games. And the, the question that we pose to us is can we use that same technique to optimize the mining operations and manufacturing operations? And, um, and, and it turns out that you can actually, you can use, uh, under certain circumstances, you can use reinforcement learning to do that, and you can use transfer learning and other such techniques to move from one operation to the other. So similar to manufacturing, we can use reinforcement learning for mining as well. And this is the sort of about uh, operator performance. So can you, this is from a, from a manufacturing facility where uh, you're making steel, uh, steel mill, sorry, not steel, you're not making steel, it's a steel mill, making, producing steel. Um, and you want to, Get, you're getting sensor data from the equipment and not the, the operator. You want to avoid collecting human data. But can you compute the performance of an operator based on uh, the operations data? So to give you an example, think about um, your driving behavior, right? So uh, if I was to able to look at the number of, say, braking events, uh, how fast you take the right turn, left turn, your behavior before a stoplight, then I can collect the data from the equipment, not from the human driver operator, and I can correct try the driving day, whether you're aggressive or not, whether you are a safe driver or super safe driver, whatever, right? Similar thing can be done in industrial domain. So we can extend this idea from uh, the human uh, operators, right? The driver is the operator of a, of, say, of a car, to operators of other kinds of equipment. So this is the intuition behind this one. In uh, quality, safety, uh, so one of the, Problem that you will very, very often see from a quality perspective is, can you detect failures earlier in the process rather late in the process? 
So as you're manufacturing something, as you're going down your process, you realize that uh, you're putting more and more cost into your whatever you're making, right? So you want to detect the failure as early as possible. So in quality perspective, that's one of the key problems to solve. To be solved is can you find where the uh, if you can find your failures early, and then the next thing you want to do is now can you then find an operating envelope to recommend to us uh, for a particular process that if you stay within these parameters you have the high risk quality, right? This turns out to be a math problem around uh, density, density estimation. And um, the idea is for different processes, you build uh, a KPI curve on the process space, process parameter space, and then you find the region where you are, we have maximum KPI uh, in that space, and then you can recommend that as the operating on. Um, and I think everyone's favorite is robotics, right? So this is from an example in, uh, in welding where you want to, as you're welding, and this sort of, and I'll give you two examples of automation. So what you want to do is you want to do image analysis of the weld that you're doing, and then based on that, take a control decision. So if the environment is somewhat contained, this is possible to do. So this is what very many people think of robotics and automation, but another way of thinking about robotics and automation is system automation. So this is an example from Fleet, um, where we are trying to do end-to-end -end optimization of what's happening on the vehicle, what's happening in the operation center, and what's happening in the maintenance, right? So if you are, say, operating an equipment, you notice something, or there's an algorithm that notices, notices something, you want to know what decision to take. So from a driver operator perspective, the decision you want to take is what should I do? Should I pull up, should I continue, or should I schedule for maintenance, right? From an operations perspective, you want to make sure the overall sort of the things fit together, meaning if I'm going to pull the truck off the road, then can I supply another truck to carry the load that the truck is sort of carrying currently? And as a maintenance shop, you want to do repair recommendation that we talked about earlier, when the state truck pulls in for repair, or any equipment pulls in for repair, do I have the right path, right labor, and can I pass on instructions as to what to do precisely, right? So this sort of global optimization is what we're trying to get to. And in some areas where there is more data, we are closer to it than otherwise. So this is the problem of uh, system level optimization. So, so these were a bunch of use cases that have went through, I know, fairly quickly. But the idea, it at least gives you a broad idea about kind of problems that you can solve in the space of industrial OI. I also want to briefly touch upon operationalization of, uh, of these AI models in the industry, because I think it's a very important problem to think about. Because as I said earlier, the cost of failure, the cost of making a mistake, is very high in the space of industrial operations, right? Because it could, there are safety implications, there are cost implications, there are profit implications. So that's why operationalizing AI solutions systematically is, is very important. And these are challenges that you see in the field. I promised you tales from the field. Um, so one example that we see is that you might have multiple AIs running in your system and they will never be consistent with each other, right? So for example, you're running an equipment um, and there might be two algorithms. Say one is doing failure prediction that comes from uh, the OEM, and you have your own data science team, which is very brilliant, and they come up with an RGL algorithm. I guarantee you, they will not agree. Well, how do you how do you solve this discrepancy? Right. So this is this becomes sort of a hard problem to solve. Right. If you're making a decision as a human being, we're seeing these two different recommendations or two different outputs from your two different AI systems. How do I manage? The other problem that you see in the field is, uh, suppose you have deployed a model, right? Now the model is deployed, uh, and say every month you say, I get additional data, so I want to update my model. Now what you want to make sure is that your models are consistent, meaning that given a particular scenario, if in the previous model I make a recommendation X, and in the new version of the model I make a recommendation Y, it will confuse the heck out of the human who's using that model, right? Because humans expect these models to behave consistently, right? So if I have the same situation today, and I'm one month later, to me it is very difficult to sort of imagine if I'm not a machine learning person, so why is the model giving me a different prediction? But a deep learning model will reach a different local optima every time, right? So how do you ensure that different iterations of the same model uh, converge? And this is sort of a very fascinating area uh, to be in. We sort of recently wrote a NIPS paper on this, but you should check it out. But I think this problem is also sort of an understudied problem, but a really important problem from an operationalization perspective. Um, the next one is 
um, the cost, right? So typically when you uh, optimize an algorithm, you optimize the accuracy, right? Everyone has a favorite metric. But what we have realized uh, is that what you really want to optimize for is some uh, business KPI. So if you can pose the business KPI into your machine learning problem, then you can directly solve for it instead of a two-step process. That's another thing to think about. Um, the fourth thing to sort of, that's not a challenge, but this is sort of something to be aware of, right? So this is uh, from an operationalization perspective. Suppose you have two, or you have multiple algorithms, right? And you're doing failure prediction again. Uh, it's a sort of simple example. So you could design an algorithm that is very aggressive, right? So, so every time it thinks there's even a small chance of failure, it will flag. It will flag. And what would happen though then is that you will get um, a high false positive rate. Right, so so you might the equipment might flag conditions which are not actually clear. On the other hand, you might have a very conservative algorithm that, unless it's very very sure, it will not flag. And in that case, will miss failure. Right. So what you really want to optimize for is your cost of uh, this algorithm. Right. You want to understand the cost of failure. You want to understand the false alarm cost. You want to compute total cost. And the algorithm that you choose is not based on accuracy, but is rather based, as we show in the figure here at minimizing some cost that you're interested in. So, so remember, if you're trying to use AI machine learning to think from a cost perspective, um, that's very important. Um, the other, I think, challenge that you will encounter is API, right? So you will, you, very often when you talk to folks and you want to operationalize a model, say I want to do a cost-based analysis, you will realize that in very many cases, even the KPI is not clear. Um, so I'll give you an example. This is cycles to failure for equipment, and I, the three sort of three buckets, right? So zero to five hundred, five hundred thousand, get in thousand. And these are two different models with F scores for each bucket. Which would you choose? It's just sort of you have to go by the gut. So is there a mathematical way of choosing the right algorithm? So so these are some of the challenges from an operationalization perspective. So I want to conclude now. Um, so these I think we talked about a bunch of this, so I'll sort of skip this, but these are some interesting open problems. I mean we're talking about this throughout the presentation about need for you. Uh, like we talked earlier on about uh, bench market assets. Um, then how do you sort of model a system of systems? How do you make cost data, right? So this is sort of a collection of those sort of open challenges. Um, where we are going, as I said earlier, is towards end-to-end -to -end optimization, right? So we talked about individual problems in the space of uh, maintenance, operations, quality, where the industry is moving towards, where people want to move towards, is sort of putting them together. We saw an example when I talked about the fleet. We are trying to optimize at the at the driver, at the operation center, and the maintenance shop. So you're going to see more and more of such applications. That's where the field is going. Um, and finally, I would like to say that you know there will be very many transportive applications. Like we talked about mining, that's just one example. Uh, manufacturing, uh, you're going to see circularity, right? Increase use of AI machine learning to figure out what to do at if the equipment is end of life. You want to reuse it, you want to remanufacture it, recycle it, so these sorts of questions um, will sort of come up and we'll use AI machine learning to make a world greener with circularity. Agriculture will be influenced by AI machine learning. It's already been with precision agriculture, but you will see automation in this space. Um, we are already seeing an energy transition and transportation. So these are some of the areas that will be transformed uh, completely by AI machine learning. So, uh, in conclusion, um, this is an important area to be working in. It will transform the world we live in, but it's still early days, there are a lot of open problems, so you should join us in sort of addressing these problems, tackling this problem, um, making them part of your sort of uh, everyday business. Um, so I want to leave 10 minutes for question and answers. Uh, hopefully there are enough Q&A but this also gives some time for the next talk to sort of wrap up. So with that, I will conclude. I know I breezed through many, many things, but if there are any questions, I can always walk. So thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Chetan, great, oh. uh, great, great presentation. Uh, we have a question from Tom Coughlin. Um, the previous question was from Deepak Matur. So Tom Coughlin asks, can you talk about what is a typical return on investment based upon industrial AI application experiences? Ah, that's actually a very good question. And I think 
that question is very difficult to answer uh, in the absence of context. Um, and so one obviously, the, the shallow answer is it depends on the situation, it depends on the industry, depends on what you're doing. Um, so for example, uh, as I uh, give the example of an airlines industry, if you can uh, correctly predict uh, failures, uh, then that is a huge, huge savings in terms of a human life save, right? Um, so, and if you do it the same for say, uh, uh, say electric electric scooters, um, then the return on any particular prediction is not that high, right? So, so definitely the the cost or the ROI, sorry, uh, depends on uh, very many things. And I think the way we often try to do is walk back from say, so what's the the cost of failure? There is a failure in the field, um, so if there's a cost of lost operations. Is there a safety implication? Uh, what is the maintenance cost in the field, right? So you have to tabulate all these costs, for example, in the maintenance case to uh, to get to understand the ROI. Uh, so this, so, so that is sort of one part of the answer. The other part of the answer, I think also is, as I said earlier, is that very often we don't know um, uh, what are the costs, right? So you would assume that people would know, like what is the cost of failure in the field? But remember, these operations are being done um, manually for such a long time, right? So you might not, the, the the corporation might not have the data for you to be able to correctly estimate what the cost of it is. Right? So then even the ROI becomes difficult to compute. They become estimates, uh, guesstimates. Yeah. So, so those are some of the challenges that you will see. Okay, we have the next question from Piero Bonisone. Uh, predictive models need to have a low variance, narrow confidence interval for the prediction to be actionable. What is your experience with ensemble models with the fusion meta model as a way to reduce such a variance? This is uh, spot on, in fact. I want to go back to this uh, work on reproducibility I talked about. In fact, if you see this paper, uh, this the way around reproducibility was using ensemble model. So uh, yeah, so so this one, right? So so ultimately, we show in this paper that if you are able to build an ensemble of your of different models, you are do you are able to do exactly what uh, I think. Uh, forgot the name. I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, Robin. I think that's spot on. So Piero said that. I think so. That's why. So one of the ways to uh, to do this is to build ensemble models to get sort of a narrower uh, variance and have more confidence. Very good point. Okay, so I have a, a couple of questions, uh, and, and I also plead to audience to type in your questions uh, in the Q and A, or you can also do it in a, in a chat window. But I, I think Q and A is better. So I have a question. Um, about federated uh, learning, uh, given that you have deployment in a limited constrained fashion, does it open opportunities for federated model? What, what are what are your uh, experiences with federated learning? Actually, I, uh, I should have better prepared for this audience. Yes, so this is a, a very up and coming area in AI machine learning, um, both from a systems perspective as well as algorithmic perspective that can you do uh, federated learning and then you can deploy these models. And it's even gaining more steam with advent of 5G, right? So the way people are using 5G is to sort of uh, 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 possibly automate more things at the edge and collect more data at the edge, push some decision making at the edge. And then this notion of federated learning becomes important, right? So, and there are a lot of sort of interesting uh, questions to be answered. One is where do you build the model? and it's and it can be hierarchical. And then at what model do you shift down to the edge? And do you update that, how do you update that model? Do you sort of, again, update the model at the core and then shift it to the edge? But this notion of federated learning is, is going to gain more importance and will be an important research area for us to think about moving forward. Okay, uh, the next question comes from Eduardo Espejel. Uh, hi, I have a question. How much of an issue is the lack of actual data for model training in the current industrial world? What are alternatives? The lack of the actual data for model training. 
it's it's it's, it's actually a, a very good question, and we often see this uh, the lack of actual data, uh, and I sort of point out the problem around failure prediction. So you might not have enough failure data. One approach that we have tried, uh, at least from a research perspective, is to use GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks, to generate uh, distributions around uh, failure. Um, we have not yet deployed these models in the field, so I don't know how they would work in the field. But using GANs is one method of generating data. Uh, and similarly, for the uh, for the work that we showed on um, on defect detection for vehicles, um, there there as well uh, because we don't have infinite amount of data, we're using GANs to generate uh, images with damages on cars, right? So we merge different data sets to get uh, uh, get that uh, image data with defects. So that is one way of overcoming that challenge. Okay, uh, we don't have any more questions from audience. Please type in your questions in Q&A. Uh, I have one more question uh, personally. So especially at the edge and in the cases when where battery is, is of limited um, power, how do you do the trade-offs between um, uh, downloading, uploading information, collecting, uh, how do you minimize the power usage at the edge, uh, et cetera? Yeah, so that actually is a very good question. I, um, so I think one thing, uh, one thing, this specific thing, which is not about optimization per data, was we do sometimes deploy these uh, prognostic algorithms on the battery itself. So, so not on the equipment on the battery that is collecting the data. And you do that to, to know if the battery is, is going to fail, then you want to replace upfront so that you don't lose collection of data. So, uh, and so this is sort of one interesting work that we sort of did recently that, that came to my mind on, on the battery thing. But, but you're right, spot on, that we do need to think about uh, how to opt. opt. So, so now, I mean, you can uh, execute a model fairly cheaply. Uh, on a cheap edge, so that's okay. I think what you try to do is not build the model at the edge. So you build the model at the core, you push it to the edge, and then you sort of execute it on the edge. That's one way of sort of tackling this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are almost um, close to the end. I know you have um, um, a meeting at 7 p.m., so we highly appreciate uh, you joining us, uh, providing a great presentation, and also thanks for engaging in very interesting um, uh, question. Actually, there's one more, if you can just jump on that one. Um, yeah, absolutely. He says, I work in area of BMS. We use high resolution data to detect equipment health. The problem we face is the data integrity. It is noisy. Can you suggest a way to clean the noisy data? I think one way is to use uh, normalization. So we often normalize data. So sometimes the noise could be because of variance in load, environmental conditions. So what you might think is noise could be variation of that. So one thing that we do for most of our model is first step is normalization of especially of sensor data. Um, and you can use uh, uh, any function for that, but we, we can use both uh, deep networks and something else and media models as well where we, uh, we learn a model to, um, uh, to essentially uh, normalize the KPI that you're looking for based on the load conditions, and that helps. Um, that does help. So that might work to try it out. Okay, thank you. That was a question from Saifu Rahman. And Saifu, I have some uh, additional information from you. I'll send it to you offline on, on, on the same question. Well, thanks again, Chaitan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shmuel, uh, you. Shatan, for introducing. I hope I see you again uh, on this uh, podcast as a listener or perhaps again as a presenter. Okay. Thank you guys for having me. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Bye.